So good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think this is probably a hectic week for you all, like with the upcoming midterm exams. So I hope you've all been preparing, and yeah, and I hope it's not too stressful. Okay. So uh, uh, with respect to the midterm, so this course also you will have a midterm as announced in the beginning. Uh, uh, so from what information I have. The uh, I mean the tentative schedule. As for the tentative schedule, your exam is on the next Saturday, not the coming Saturday, but the following Saturday morning, uh, ten to twelve. Okay. So I mean uh, this is just a tentative thing. So you will get a formal announcement from the academic section. So that's going to be <clears throat> that's going to be the final schedule. So uh, with respect to the portion so whatever is covered till end of this week will be there for the midterm um, and yeah in terms of preparation so as i've been saying like you know you should uh, for whatever material that you look at from textbooks i mean the end of the chapter there are a lot of these questions that are there so working them out will it should give you good practice of course, we have the assignment questions and everything, but it's a very small subset. You know? So to you know really understand the subject matter, you should try out these questions at the back of the textbook. Um, another resource is we've been following is uh, Professor Ramadi's course in Princeton. So uh, the lectures we've been following. So uh, there are also the exams and you know Professor Ramadi's assignments. Th those are all available as well. Uh, so those are also up on his course page if you check it so even that is that is a good resource for you to you know practice and you know prepare for the exam okay so uh, yeah good luck with the preparations uh, and if there are any questions yeah feel free to contact uh, me or Gaurav as always okay um, so your first assignment it's we are kind of done with the evaluation, but I mean, there's some more adjustments to be done. Uh, so you, you will hear, you will uh, get back the solutions or your marks and everything sometime this week. Okay, so I will also try to, you know, upload the solutions so that, you know, uh, if you've made some mistakes, you can just check and uh, see what's the solutions. Okay, so uh, yeah, those are some announcements. Uh, so now, uh, before we yeah, I wanted to start linear programs today, but just before that, I just wanted to clarify some things about the Farkas lemma. Okay, so let me just share the screen first. Okay, so I think it should be visible now. Okay, so um, yeah, I was just thinking a little more about you know the class, and it was, but I was just reviewing like how. Uh, the discussion went. There was this question that um, I think was Nidish who asked, like in the beginning of when I told the Farkas lemma and the intuitions. So there was some question that he asked um, about you know the system. I mean about uh, what the two systems mean. And I felt that you know there's uh, something more that I should clarify. I mean. Uh, I don't know if his question got clarified by the end of the class last time, but let me just tell you uh, the intuition once. I mean, I just want to clarify some points here. Mm. Okay, so this was the statement of the Farkas lemma, right? So uh, we had that you know exactly one of the following two systems is feasible. Okay, so uh, so that means like you know if. One, if you if there is an x such that a x equals b x greater than or equal to zero, then you cannot find a y like this. Okay, and if you can, if this system has a solution, if there is a y such that you know this is true, then you cannot find um, an x such that b uh, lies in this scope. Okay, so let's uh, let me just draw this once more. So uh, the first system was something like this, right? So you have these vectors a one. Uh, and so on up to a n. So these are the column vectors of a. Okay. So and suppose um, so basically the statement is just this. Okay. So that b. So so this is one possibility. So b lies here, or uh, the other option is something like this, right? So a one to a n lie like this, and b is something 
you know, which is outside the cone. So as far as any vector b you take, these are the only two possibilities. Either it lies in the cone or it doesn't lie in this cone. Okay, so this is the cone. The cone spanned by a1 to a n is basically this whole region, this infinite uh, space in this whole region. So either b lies in within this or it doesn't lie within this. So the Farkas lemma is just telling you that. Okay, uh, so the first statement is that b lies in this cone. So now if uh, the system is infeasible, so you know b doesn't lie in this cone. So what you can do is, uh, you know, there is something. So it is, it's, uh, it's exactly this is the scenario we are looking at. So then there is something which, uh, you know, there's some uh, plane. Okay, so something like this, which so that all the a's, the column vectors of a, so the a one to a n's lie on one side of this hyperplane, and b lies on the other side. Okay, so uh, this y, this vector here would be, you could interpret this as the normal to this hyperplane. Okay, so that's what the statement is. So uh, one thing I want to clarify here is it doesn't mean that, you know, every hyperplane you take, uh, this is going to happen. Okay, so it's, so because there are so many hyperplanes, right? So you can draw a hyperplane like this, uh, something like this, so many are there. But uh, you know, this won't happen for all the hyperplanes. It just means that there is at least one hyperplane for which all the A's lie on one side and the B lies on the other side. Okay, so that is something I wanted to clarify. Now, it could also happen, uh, you know, sometimes like the system, the A, the vectors A, those themselves are, you know, say, say something like this. So I'm just take one example where A1, A2, A3. OK, so if you have something like this, now, uh, so forget about B for the time being. So if you just look at this system, now even satisfying this, right? So A transpose Y less than 0. So basically find a hyperplane, finding a hyperplane such that all the A's lie on one side. That itself is not feasible for this set, right? Because any hyperplane you take, there'll be at least one of the vectors which will lie on the other side. So. Um, if you take something like this, then A1 lies on one side, A2, A3 lie on the other side. So something like this, you take A2 lies on one side and A1, A3 lie on the other side. Okay. So uh, so this is in the system, like, you know, uh, by default, by the definition of the system, the ways A's are defined, the system two is not going to have a solution. Okay. So it's never going to have a solution. Whatever B you take, even since A transpose Y less than or equal to zero, that itself is not feasible. So the B transpose Y is also not, I mean, I mean, the overall system is also not going to be feasible. So in that case, this one is going to be, the system one is going to be feasible for every, any B you take. So what it's telling you is now, if you have vectors like this, okay, so uh, the span of these, the, uh, you know, the cone span by this is basically the entire space. Okay, so now if you take any vector, so whatever b you take, you can write it as, you know, it lies in this cone. Okay, so if you take a b here, this will also lie in this cone. So for every b, this will happen. So, uh, yeah, so I think Nidish asked something about, uh, you know, uh, these column vectors making an obtuse angle with the y's. Okay, so uh, why is it necessary that all of them make an obtuse angle? So the answer to that is, no, it's not you know you can have some systems where uh, you know you cannot find a y which make an obtuse angle with all the a's okay so what this is telling you is that you know uh, it's just that there exists some y which satisfies this or if that doesn't exist there is some x which uh, you know so where you can write b as you know ax okay so it's just an uh, about the existence of some x and y and it's not about you know saying that for all hyperplanes this is true or something of that sort. Okay, uh, so I hope uh, this is clear. So I just wanted to check with uh, the Nidish, right? So yes, it's 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 clear, man. It's clear. Okay, good. Yes, so yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so I hope uh, then we discuss the proof. So I hope uh, the issues with the proof have been, um, you know, you've you've, cl you've uh, clarified those by you know going through the steps and all that. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, please do feel free to ask if anything. Um, uh, yeah, either here or even later you can email. So. Uh,
today now what I will do is I will uh, get into linear programs. Okay. Uh, so this is a class of uh, constrained optimization problems. Okay. So so far we uh, had been looking at unconstrained problems, and then we looked at some notions of you know convexity, and uh, yeah, so we discussed some properties of convex functions, convex sets, and in general, convex optimization problems. Okay, so uh, what I would like to start off with now is, uh, you know, move towards constraint optimization. And in particular, we will, you know, look at uh, the, sim the, yeah, the sort of simplest form of the constraint optimization problem. So recall that uh, any constraint optimization problem was of, uh, yeah, so it was of this form, right? So you had something like minimize f of x such that uh, g i x is less than or equal to 0 for all i, and you had some inequality constraints. Okay, so this was how we initially we said constraint optimization problems would be like. Okay, now um, a very special form of this constraint optimization problem is the linear programming. Um, the linear programming class. So where the function f is linear, okay, so, uh, so suppose x is the decision variable, so objective function is summation ci, so this is just summation ci xi, okay, so it's linear in x, okay, and the constraints are also linear in x, okay, so the constraints have this form ax equals b for some matrix A, so suppose um, there are n uh, decision variables. So x is in Rn. So now A is uh, of size Rm cross n. Okay, and B is in Rm. So what this means is you have like a set of you know m equations. Okay, so you have m equations and n variables. Okay, and uh, so these are all linear equations. Okay, uh, that's the point. So these are all linear equations, and um, yeah, you also have some uh, inequalities like x greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is the form of a linear programming problem. Uh, you could also have other variants like you know this need not be an equality a x equal b. You could have something like min c transpose x a x greater than or equal to b. I mean even this need not be there. The x greater than or equal to zero. That so there are different uh, uh, variants you could take. So these equalities or inequalities that it's not. Um, but it's, it's not uh, compulsorily of that form. You could have inequalities as well as equalities here. And this uh, non-negativity, that's also not mandatory. Okay, so the important thing about linear programs is that the objective and the constraints are all linear in X. Okay, and uh, this is also a class of uh, convex optimization problems. So we saw about convex sets, convex functions. So this is an example where the objective function is convex and also the you know the constraints are also convex okay the set is convex okay so uh, we will look uh, into more detail on this so this is this class is it has a lot of applications so some things are you know we saw it in the introductory class and we talked of max flow but in general like you know in uh, various industries and various companies and so on uh, this is a class which gets used a lot Okay, and uh, also if you you know want to formulate some problem, and if you ultimately get a linear program which you know uh, does what you need, then people are generally happy because you know these uh, there are uh, all these solvers which are very efficient nowadays for these linear programs. Okay, uh, so you have seen some things. I mean, an example of that in your uh, assignment. So probably in your assignment you had uh, the decision variables to be integer in addition. Um, but yeah, in general, if you don't have those integer constraints, I mean, what you have is a linear program and that is, uh, it's very efficiently solvable. Okay. Uh, so we will uh, just see some examples of this first, like where it arises. So one example is in transportation. Okay. So uh, think of a scenario where there are, you know, uh, many uh, goods or some there's some items which you send from different source from different sources. Okay, so there are several sources, and so maybe m sources, and there are n destinations. Okay, so uh, you want to send. I mean, so these are kind of uh, the origin, okay, or the supply uh, side 
the uh, the end of these uh, nodes and the there is a demand for these products in end of these places okay so the idea is to send items from these sources to this destination okay and for sending something say from this node one to this uh, destination node one there is a cost of c11 okay and for sending something from here a the first source node to the second destination node there's a cost of c12 and so on so the idea is you want to send um, uh, items so that the cost of sending doing this uh, you know uh, sending items is as low as possible but at the same time you want the demand at the destination to be met so at each of these there is a uh, demand so at the first node the demand is for b1 units for second uh, node at this place there's a demand for b2 units and so on now in the source side there is a capacity limit so uh, the maximum capacity that can be sent from this node is A1. Maybe it's something about there are some factories there and the maximum they can produce is something like A1. Okay, And in this place, the capacity uh, limit is A2. Okay, So with this, how can you send the, uh, you know, the amount of uh, items so as to meet the demand? but as well as uh, reduce the cost and also ensure that all these capacity constraints are met okay so i hope the setting is clear okay so uh, you know this you can formulate as a linear program okay uh, so uh, it's quite i mean you saw some other similar examples earlier so how you would formulate is something like this right you have xijs so that would be something, the quantity that you send from I to J, from source node I to a destination J. OK? Um, right? And the cost is something like this, Cij, Xij. And there are M sources and N destinations. So that's where you have this sort of double summation. And this is something. This is the objective that you want to minimize. Okay. Now, on the constraint side, you have these uh, capacity constraints. So, um, you know, uh, for each of the sources, so for I is 1 to M, right, uh, the total amount that you send from, so say this is the ith node, and the amount that you send from, to all these places, that should be equal to AI. Okay. And... Uh, also, so you don't want any leftover thing. So ideally, you could also have something like this, less than or equal to AI, because you don't want to send more than you know what can be produced from here. But maybe you also don't want to you know uh, store something back in those uh, factories. So that's where you have uh, you could say it's equal to AI, okay? And uh, also you have a demand to be met here. So for each of the destination nodes. If you take this sum, okay, for all the in incoming uh, flow or the incoming uh, quantity from each of these source nodes, if you sum that up, you should have bi, okay. So, uh, so these are the constraints of the problem, and uh, you have encoded up and en encoded with these uh, with respect to these decision variables, and uh, you have the quantities to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is actually the formulation. So, yeah, this reminds me of uh, one point like regarding your assignments. So, when you're asked to formulate uh, uh, an optimization problem, what we are asking for is something like this: a mathematical representation of the problem. Okay, so the decision variables and also the constraints and objectives. So many of you have, um, I mean, uh, I know the idea is there and you've implemented in Gurubi. Uh, and you've described what the objective and constraints are, but when, when you're asked to write a formulation, this is the one that you need to write uh, in the in mathematical notations. Okay, uh, so that's the language uh, kind of, of optimization. So, yeah, keep uh, just remember that. Okay, so uh, I hope this is clear. This formulation, right? Um, right. Uh, any questions on? this formulation no, no. okay yeah so uh, yeah so 
yeah this is uh, this is one example of a transportation problem okay now another example for a linear program is this problem of max flows that you already saw uh, in the first class so here there was something about you know a single source uh, and a single destination okay so um, so you are sending some commodities from the source to a destination but there are many intermediate uh, nodes as well through which it goes through which the commodities go and you also wanted to ensure that uh, uh, at every node at every uh, place how much you get from all the other nodes how much comes in is equal to how much ever that goes out and each link had a capacity constraint okay so that if you remember we coded that up as uh, this problem this max flow problem okay so the constraints here was uh, to maintain the flow i mean to have uh, th it's called uh, flow conservation at each of these nodes okay so there's no balance of flow okay so that was the thing and also you had these capacity constraints so something like this right xij less than or equal to cij so this is um, yeah this is the network flow problem and in fact uh, even this the transportation problem it is uh, in some sense um, a special case of the network flow problem so in all generality this network flow uh, encompasses many such uh, problems many applications okay so uh, this is also something you saw so here also the variables were xijs and you had uh, the constraints were linear and the objective was also linear so this in this case v was also variable so the variables were v and x okay and uh, v did not have any other constraints v did not have any greater than or equal to constraint but uh, implicitly it would end up have uh, being non negative because of you know, these constraints on v okay so this was an other example that you saw okay so now uh, there's another example of this what is called the diet problem okay so here the problem is there are several food items okay so maybe something like what we have every day like rice dal chapatis or whatever okay and each of these food items have some cost so that is ci okay so the cost of the ith food item is ci and there are various ingredients that go into uh, you know each of these foods so something like you know uh, the nutrients basically so something like carbs proteins and so on okay so uh, you always need some amount of uh, nutrients right you need some uh, specified amount of each of the nutrients okay and uh, each of the food item has some uh, uh, you know some quantity of nutrients so the ith food item has some aij units of nutrient j okay and uh, you also for each of these ingredients so for the jth ingredient you need at least bj units okay so that is for uh, for a health to you know maintain your health you need something like this so uh, what is the i mean how how would you you know purchase these food items okay such that the overall cost is minimum and also you have the essential nutrients that your body requires okay so how would you formulate this um first so i would like you guys to try this out so what are the variables here the, okay are you all here yes ma'am okay so uh yeah some um why don't some of you try this out like let me know what is the um how would you formulate this am our objective would be to minimize summation of ci uh okay so ci is something that is given to you okay so um if you had to minimize uh, summation i mean this is a summation ci means that's given to you okay so you need something else right like you uh, first thing let's think of what are the decision variables right summation aij over i should be uh, greater than equal to bj 
for all J. Uh, summation. A i j over i should be greater than or equal to b j for all j. Uh, so one thing is these are all given to you. So the c i's, b j's, a i j's, these are the quantities that are all known to you beforehand. Okay. So what you need to find is uh, how much of each of like how how many I mean what is the quantity of each of the food item that you oh, should so purchase. So then we can AIJ. in terms of decision variables we can keep a binary variable for each food item right so something like xi right so um, yeah so why is it binary why a binary either we buy it or we don't buy it okay you're saying that way so i think the uh, so in terms of the question uh, what you're asked to find is the quantities okay so uh, yeah, what is the quantity that you need to uh, find of each of the food items? So if you have it as a binary variable, then you may not even meet all the, uh, you know, the required nutrients, right? So you need to find the quantity. So how can this, I mean, yeah, minimize the... Oh, you know, okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Right. Oops, so XI, I you can... Uh, pardon? Yeah, XI. That would be XI AIG is greater than or equal to BJ. Okay. okay, so let me just try this once more. So let's say Xi is the quantity uh, of ith food item okay, that you want to purchase. Okay, uh, to be purchased. Okay, so now, uh, so now what do you do? Minimize Ci Xi. So minimize ci xi summation summation okay so this is there are n food items so i is one to n right yes sir okay and subject, subject to, to uh, summation aij xi over i is greater than or equal to bj is greater than or equal to bj so the i food has uh, yeah j uh, I mean, as has AIJ of nutrient J, so you have this thing. So this is true for all J. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. And you also have uh, the X i's are greater than or equal to zero. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. So uh, yeah, I hope this is clear to all of you. Right. So can you just type if the formulation makes sense? Uh, Ma'am, do we additionally need to constrain uh, that they have to be integers? Or? Uh, yeah, so it depends on the problem that is given to you. So if you, you if you can have fractional values, um, so maybe like one and a half kgs or half kgs, so okay. that is okay. So then uh, you don't need the integer constraint. Okay. Yeah, so for this problem, we are assuming that you don't have any such uh, things about integer. You can have it on the real uh, line. Okay. Ma'am. Yes. For a particular minimum cost, there can be more than one allocation. So, how do we choose among them? Uh, say it again. For a particular minimum cost, cost uh, there can be more than one allocation. Mm -hmm. so, so, how do we choose among them? So what, it, what you're saying is, um, suppose there is some x's which achieve this, right? I mean, if there is some, uh, so this value, suppose let's call it z, right? So there can be multiple uh, ways of purchasing these food items to get the same value of z. Yes, ma'am. Right? So, so yeah, so the idea is we don't care like which of those you choose. I mean, you just want some kind of an allocation which minimizes this. So any particular, uh, I mean, any uh, such allocation is OK. Right? Rajneesh? Yes, ma'am, clear. Right? OK. Yeah. So uh, yeah, all you care is about this objective. Okay? Um, so that's the case with um, any optimization problem. So all the optimization problems we've been looking at so far, uh, yeah, if there are multiple um, multiple, uh, you know, assignments to which give you the same optimal value, that is fine. You don't mind um, 
any one of these. Okay, so that's uh, the idea in this uh, kind of a thing. But yeah, if you want some more, uh, you know, some more specifications on these decision variables, if you want to make a choice even then out of these optimal, out of those optimal variables, then you probably have to put, you have to change your objective a little bit. Okay, or once you get that, maybe you have to use some other metric. But for the purposes of you know all these discussions, you don't uh, mind. You, you don't have you don't have any particular criteria to choose among the set of optimum. Okay, so yeah, and also this uh, indeed this is a convex optimization problem. So if you have uh, you could have multiple optimum, and they, uh, the thing is that they'll all give you the same solution. Okay, so you can. There's no um, idea of local and global optima for these kind of problems. Okay, um, all right. So now uh, this one more example that I wanted to go over with you. So this is from uh, this textbook, this Hill, uh, Lieberman book, which you know, I had earlier given for you guys to read for formulations. So this is the case of you know there are you know uh, some two products that has have to be produced and there are some other plants some factories which are doing this work okay so let me just open that uh, yeah so this is the example so there's this company which is you know uh, producing um, some items so there are these products this product one and two which need to be produced and there are these three plants plants one two and three Okay, so there's, there's three plants which have, you know, uh, they specialize in different items, okay, or different tasks, okay. And uh, so to produce these products, you need some work to be done from all these three plants, okay. But now each of these plants have some uh, limit on, you know, the amount of time that you can spend in these plants, okay. So, uh, so that is kind of given here in this table. Okay, so for plant one, the number of uh, hours that you can use plant one is at max four hours because this plant is also involved in many other, uh, you know, production activities. Okay, and for plant two, you can at max employ this plant for 12 hours and for plant three, you can at, at max employ it for 18 hours. Okay, now for the first product, you need uh, one hour from plant one and you don't need plant two at all. Okay. So for the first product, you need one hour from plant one and three hours from plant three. Okay. And uh, for the second product, you need two hours from plant two and two hours from plant three. Okay. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, way you can, you know, the kind of split that you need in order to produce these products. Okay. And uh, the, you know, for each batch you produce, uh, for product one, there is this profit of three thousand, and for product two, there is this profit of five thousand dollars. Okay, so how the question is, how much of each product should you produce? Okay, and so that of course the profit is maximized, but you are also able to manage such a production. Okay, in terms of the you know these uh, time constraints by these various plants. Okay, so this is the uh, problem setting. Okay, so if you uh, have read this part, so you will have this whole description given to you here. Okay, so about all these uh, things about, you know, what is a problem setting. So typical industries will have, you know, this is the kind of specification that will be given to them. Okay, and from this, you have to kind of infer this kind of a table. Okay, so in this case, the table was already given because that was the data that was given and uh, Okay, so, uh, but in many cases, you are just going to be like given this whole uh, specification. And from this, you have to, you know, devise a formulation. Okay, so uh, let's try to see what is the formulation for this. Can you, can somebody tell me the formulation? It's very similar to the question you had in our assignment that how much work has to be done, limit to, that only we can, yes. each room, room at and I can only do two hours of work. So yes. minimize the total time. So. Yes. Yeah. In your um, yeah, in your assignment, you uh, had in particular you had this question of you know who gets to do which task, right? Yes. So there you had something like the variables were all integer variables. Binary right? because, variables. Uh, yeah, binary variables exactly. Okay. So, but in this case, it's um, 
it's not that way because yes, you know, I mean, with that difference is there. But yeah, you're right. So the idea is kind of similar. Okay. So um, yeah. So I mean, even the systematic process is uh, given here. So you know, you say that the number of batches of each of the products that's produced is x1 and x2. Okay, and this uh, something like this three. Okay, so three thousand x one plus five thousand x two. So that is the item quantity that you want to maximize. So here they have given it in terms of you know in thousands. So it's uh, just three x one plus five x two that you want to maximize. Now in terms of the time, okay. So each unit of x one. I mean each unit of product one. Uh, you know you will. Need one uh, hour from plant one. So if there are um, x one batches that are there, then you will need the number of uh, you know hours you need will be exactly x one x one times one. So it's just x one. So if you look at uh, plant three, you will need three x one. That is the number of hours that you will need. Okay. So in that manner, so the number of uh, hours demanded from plant one. That is just uh, in terms of both the products, it's just going to be x1, okay? And that has to be less than or equal to four. So that gives you the first constraint, okay? Now, in terms of the second plan, uh, you have x2 of uh, the product two, okay? And yeah, and the, you uh, you need two hours from plan two for that. For plan uh, and for product one, there is no necessity for plan two. So what this means is that two times this x two has to be less than or equal to twelve. Okay. Now for the third uh, plant, in terms of product one, you need three hours per batch, so three x one overall. And for product two, it's two x two overall. So uh, three x. Yes. By using so x one for each of those plants, x one x two the same x one x two for each of the plants. Aren't you essentially saying that plant one, if say if they are manufacturing four units. Plant three also has to manufacture four units of product one. Why are we using no, the no. same variables? No, no. So the, uh, yeah. So the idea of the question is um, not that you know you you don't want to assign something like a different unit for each plant. That's not the idea. So the overall idea is you are running this company and you have these two products. So you just want to know how many products to produce. Okay, and you are then employing for to produce these products. You are then employing the services of these three plants. Okay, so for each thing, each uh, product, I mean, so for product one, if you produce one batch, it has to go through all these plants. I mean, as per this requirement. Okay, so whatever you produce of product one has to go through these plants. Whatever you produce of product two, has to you know go through these plants. Right. So each plant has to manufacture. Well, if they can manufacture, they have to manufacture the same number of uh, items, same number of. Yes. Yeah, so, so if you read this uh, description here, so in um, so you see, plant one is specializing in these kind of things. That you're kind of dividing the. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a pipeline, not in the sense of dividing, but uh, there's something to produce oh. product. So, for example, product um, one, if you have to produce, there's something that plant one has to do, and there's okay. also something that plant three has to do. Okay, so, both these have to work in tandem to produce product one. Okay? Yes. It's clear? Okay. So, yeah, so these kind of things are some things that have to be inferred by, you know, reading these, I mean, reading the descriptions. Okay? So, um, so, yeah, with this time, so that's why we have these time constraints mentioned in this way. So for uh, plant one, I mean, there is, though plant one is helping you to produce product one and two, it's also working on many other things. So that's why there is this constraint of number of hours that can be devoted for your products. Yes, okay. Okay. So, uh, so in that way, this is how you get the formulation. So the profit is to be maximized. And uh, these are the, uh, you know, the constraints that come as a result of the production time having these constraints. Okay, and you also want uh, these. Uh, of course, the quantities have to be non-negative. So that's why this is going to be the linear program. So this is the formulation. 
okay so uh, any questions on this no ma'am okay so rohit it's clear so what about the others um we're all very quiet again it's, it's the morning blues it's clear bhavna is clear okay 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 good so yeah fine so uh yeah so so these are some examples uh, of uh, formulations of i mean which of the kind of things that get formulated as linear programs so it's a huge list okay so uh, i just wanted to illustrate some of the kind of problems that get formulated this way now in order to solve these right so uh, one thing if you notice the formulation here so in terms of the math formulation you have uh, this kind of a thing so min c transpose x a x equals b i mean this is one of the representations that you have okay so now uh, one thing is uh, you know the assumption is usually that m is much less than n okay it's much less than so it's not uh, equal to so it's less than n so if m is equal to n so if you have this kind of a square matrix now uh, as assuming a is invertible then you will it will be a unique solution right so that is not uh, a case that is um, Uh, being talked of in linear programming of course that comes as a sub category but that's not an interesting case because if there's only one solution so the idea is if you have this m is less than n okay so then you have like this kind of a you know the a is this kind of a wide matrix so uh, it has a non you know it's not it has a non trivial null space and there are a huge number of solutions for this problem okay so that's the uh, problem that's usually of interest okay so out of this huge number of solutions what is the best value okay so um, it's actually number of solutions is you know infinite and so you want to find out of these what is the best uh, one which gives you the solution okay so uh, let's just see a geometrical notion of these um, right so we'll just take this example so suppose the lp given to you is this this is in two dimensions okay so uh, you have these two constraints and the objective is this and you have this non negativity constraint okay so these are all inequalities okay so now uh, let's just see what it means pictorially okay so uh, this is okay so suppose this is x1 and this is the x2 axis okay so this uh, let's just take the first constraint right let's just try to characterize this constraint region so this space so first of all all these have to be uh, x1 and x2 are greater than or equal to 0 so we are essentially looking at the first quadrant so this uh, set that's our feasible set is going to be a subset of the first quadrant okay and uh, the first constraint is x1 plus 2 x2 is less than or equal to 3 so let's just see what it looks like Okay, so I'm just marking these. Of course, not drawn to scale, but okay. So, uh, so the first constraint is x1 plus x2 less than or equal to three. So let me draw this line x1 plus x2 equal to three. X1 plus two x2 equal to three. So when x2 is zero, you have x1 is three. So this is one point, and you have x2 when x1 is uh, sorry when x1 is zero, you have x2 is uh, 1.5. So something here. and when x2 is 0 you have x1 is 3 so you have these two points which lie on the line okay so uh, so the line is something like this this is where my tablet drawing skills will come into display okay not bad so yeah so this is this is the first line okay and you have x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 3 okay so uh, a quick check to see which region is it whether it's this region above or whether it's this region below right a quick check is you know origin lies uh, so if you take 0 0 that will you know lie less than or equal to 3 so then it's uh, this is the region okay so this part of the uh, line is uh, what is meant by this constraint okay so now um, 
the let's do the same thing for the next line okay so can you tell me the two points which lie on the line 2x1 plus x2 equal to 3 uh, 0 comma 3 x1 is 0 and x2 is 3 3 okay so something this one right right uh, yes okay. right. and uh, x2 is 0 x1 is uh, 1.5 1.5 so something here right so this so some line like this okay so which side do we take is it this side or is it this side um Zero zero is allowed, so. So you take this side, right? Right. Yes, so basically, something like this. Okay. So everything to the, uh, to this side, and for this line also everything to this side. So the feasible region effectively becomes, you know, an intersection of both these. So it's going to be this, um, uh, this polygon that we see here. Okay. So this has uh, this is a huge space, right? I mean, huge space in the sense of you know there are infinitely many points. It's the uncountable number of points in this region. Okay. Uh, so is this clear? Like how we drew the feasible set? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, what about the others? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Good. So, um, yeah, so this is a feasible region. Now let's look at these constraints, right? So x1, so this is minus x1. The constraint is something of this form, minus x1 minus x2. So let us say, uh, some. let's take some fixed value. So minus x1 plus minus x2, suppose this is value some z. And let us say this value is, um, say, minus 1. Okay, so this is the line where x1, so I'm just trying to uh, chart out the contours of the function, the objective function. Okay, so if you take x1 uh, plus x2 equals 1, so this would be something here, right? Let me just draw it with different colors. So the contour would be something like this. So for this is the uh, objective function corresponding to minus x1 minus x2 is equal to minus 1. Okay, and now uh, if you had x1, I mean, if, if corresponding to the contour minus 2, you will have something like this, right? So these, uh, so you can construct the contours in this way, okay? Now, uh, what the question is, uh, you know, what is the minimum value of this, okay? So uh, if you take something here, so if you, if, so all these parallel lines are the contours, these ones in black, okay? So this is the line x1 minus x1 minus x2 is 0 okay and uh, as you go away so as you go along this direction okay so these contours uh, go on decreasing further right and the point is how far can you go so uh, how what is the farthest you can go such that you remain in this uh, feasible region and you have the uh, minimum value okay so it would be also a parallel line such that it meets at this vertex here. Okay, so that is the best you can keep going. Okay, so maybe I should just show you. So this is an example from uh, Dimitri Bertsimers' book. So I think the picture is illustrated better there. Okay, so this is exactly the problem we had. And the feasible region and the contours are shown here. Okay, so um, this is a feasible region we saw, right? The one in gray. And the contours are like this. So minus x1 minus x2 is 0. Minus x1 minus x2 here. This one is minus 2 and so on. OK. So uh, you're trying to minimize this. And um, you remember like you know the gradient of this function. OK. So this minus x1 minus x2. So the gradient is going to be uh, what? It's minus 1 minus 1, right? So that's exactly the value of c that we had in the original form. And that points in this direction. And remember, the gradient uh, gives the you know direction of maximum increase. So now we're trying to decrease the function value. So the reverse direction, so something along this side, is what um, reduces the function value. And you keep going till uh, at the best possible value, such that you remain in this feasible set. And that comes at this point. Okay, So this is the solution. And this is the optimum value.
okay so that's the graphical idea for these linear programs so is this uh, notion clear uh yes ma'am but could you go back to the diagram for a second yeah so in this one the constraint is 2x1 plus x2 is less than 3 and x1 plus 2x2 is less than 3 not less than equal to so for example if we had to maximize this uh, the objective function 1 one, 1 one would not be allowed so in that actually, case how would uh, we write no no so actually in this case uh, what oh. they've shown here is just the region that this is less than 3 okay okay sorry. okay so for uh, the problem it is less than or equal to itself Yes. Okay, so that's why even the boundary is part of the feasible set. Yeah, yes. But uh, of course, your question is valid in the sense that you know uh, you can have those kind of problems x one plus x two. I mean something like strictly less than. Okay, so then in that case, um, you know this one one is not going to be a solution. Okay, in that I mean, case, it's I not going to be. We can have a solution because then that infimum problem uh, that you described earlier would come up. Yeah. So if you have just uh, if you have it just in terms of these two variables, yeah, that issue would come up. But you'll see later that you know sometimes um, you know many uh, constraints will still be written in that way, and in some cases you still can have a solution. I mean, of course, if all the equations have this less than or equal to mean, I mean less than uh, strictly less than, then perhaps not. You may not have it. but uh, there is a way to transform those kind of uh, linear programs into a form that we desire okay so um, yeah so I, i will come to that maybe in the next class but um, yeah so for now i just i would like you to you know uh, get this idea of you know this graphical method okay yes sir okay. so any questions so far Mama. Okay. Rohit is clear. What about the others? Har Simran. Yes, ma'am. It's clear. It's clear. Okay. Um, Siddharth. Siddharth Solanki. It's clear. Okay. What about Lakshmi? so you can type there so is it clear to you lakshmi it's clear okay so uh, yeah i hope um, it's uh, more or less clear to you all so maybe some of you might have seen this graphical method in your earlier in your school days i don't know if some syllabus has had this but anyway i thought um, you know just it's uh, good to have this picture for everyone okay so now um, yeah in the next class i think we are running out of time so next class i will move on to some more details so i will try to move into how you can solve this i mean we have seen one method we will look at other approaches for solving this okay so i will uh, stop the class here and you know i'll just hang around for if you have questions so thanks a lot for coming i'll see you on thursday thank you ma'am